Today I want to look at a really beautiful property of the Pythagorean triples that I learned about from a problem in Math Magazine. So this is from a 2016 issue. And what is this property? Well, it says that if you have a Pythagorean triple, A, B, C, then A to the 2n plus 1 plus B to the 2n plus 1 plus C to the 2n plus 1 over A, B, C is an integer. So what that really means is the numerator is a multiple of the denominator. So let's notice that this is going to be true for all non-negative integers n, and maybe the case when n is equal to 0 is super boring because we just get a plus b plus c in the numerator and the denominator, so that the quotient is 1. And so in order to get an idea of how this might work, let's explore the next case. And so the next case would be the n equals 1 case. But the n equals 1 case would be like the sum of the cubes in the numerator. So that means that's something that we need to look at. Okay, so let's look at a cubed plus b cubed plus c cubed and see if we can do some sort of manipulation on this so that it's kind of an obvious multiple of a plus b plus c. And let's notice we've got a given from the fact that this is a Pythagorean triple, and that is that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's, of course, what we mean by saying we have a Pythagorean triple. Okay, so how can we use that? Well, I think the best way to use that is to take the c cubed and factor it into c times c squared. But perhaps if we're doing that, we should factor the first two terms in a similar way. So here, I'll write this as a times a squared plus b times b squared plus c times c squared. And then next up, I'll take that c squared and write it as a squared plus b squared, you know, like we can because we've got a Pythagorean triple here. So we'll have a times a squared plus b times b squared plus c times a squared plus b squared. Okay, great. And now let's recall that our main goal here is really to factor and a plus b plus c out of this equation. And so that means perhaps we want to add and subtract the same thing. In other words, add a copy of zero so we have an obvious way to factor an a plus b plus c out of this. But maybe we'll do one preparatory step again just to like set this up a little bit. So let's maybe write this as a times a squared plus c times a squared, and then plus b times b squared plus c times b squared. And I put a little bit of a gap right here because I want to make it clear that it looks like we're missing something. And like I said, since we're trying to factor out an a plus b plus c, I think it's pretty clear what we're missing. So in order to get an a plus b plus c out of this by factoring a squared out, well, we're going to need a b times a squared. But if we added that in, we also have to subtract it. So let's do that over here. So minus b times a squared. Okay, but then again, let's see about these two terms. Well, we can factor a b squared out and we have b plus c. But in order to get an a plus b plus c, which is our goal, we'll need an a times b squared term. But that means we need to subtract that as well. So a times b squared. And now let's see, we'll do a little bit of grouping. So we'll group these three terms as well as these three terms. And let's see what we've got. So we can factor an a squared out of this first lot, and we'll have a squared times a plus b plus c. We can factor a b squared out of this second lot. We'll have b squared a plus b plus c. And then what can we do with that last bit? Well, my greatest common factor there is a times b. So I can factor a minus a times b out of that, 
and I'll be left with a plus b. Okay, so let's look at what we have. So notice these first two terms are definitely multiples of a plus b plus c. That's pretty clear. But that last term is not a clear multiple of a plus b plus c. And in fact, this a plus b is most definitely not going to be a multiple of a plus b plus c. So our only hope is for a times b to be a multiple of a plus b plus c. So let's just say hopefully um, this is also a multiple of a plus b plus c. And if we can show that that a times b is in fact a multiple of a plus b plus c, then, well, this entire thing will be a multiple of that. And we've really completed our result in this special case when n is equal to one. And not only have we created our result in that case, but I think we've got an outline for how to do this in general. Okay, so let's maybe add that as a lemma over here. And when I say that, I mean this fact that we would like a times b to be a multiple of a plus b plus c. Okay, so maybe I'll put it like this. So we have, maybe how should we write this? Maybe a times b over a plus b plus c is an integer. And this is, of course, in the same setup where we have a Pythagorean triple. Okay, so now that we've kind of motivated the need for this lemma, let's go ahead and prove it. Okay, so we just motivated the need for the following lemma. And we actually saw that if we have this fact, then we can indeed prove our claim pretty easily. So let's see if we can prove this lemma. So I'm going to start off with the left-hand side of that. So I've got a times b over a plus b plus c. Okay, great. Now I'm going to take that numerator and I'm going to write it in a certain way. I'm going to write it as one-half times 2ab. So in other words, I'm like multiplying by 2 over 2. In other words, multiplying by the number 1. And now we've got a 2ab in there. But any time you see 2ab, you should be thinking about the difference between a sum of squares and, well, the original sum where you've taken the quantity squared. In other words, like the difference between reality and the so-called freshman's dream. And so what I mean by that is we can take that stuff inside of the parentheses and write it as the difference in a plus b quantity squared minus a squared minus b squared. So that's going to be all over a plus b plus c. Okay, so I think that's pretty clear why we can do that. But let's recall that we definitely have a Pythagorean triple. I mean, that's like one of our original assumptions, which means that we can take this object right here, this difference of a squared and b squared, and write it as, well, just taking subtraction by c squared. Okay, so that's good news. So let's see what we have. In the numerator, we'll have one half and then we'll have a plus b squared minus c squared, and then in the denominator we have a plus b plus c. Okay, so that's good. Next up, what we'll do is notice that what we've got inside of these large parentheses is a difference of squares. There's a standard way of factoring a difference of squares, and that's exactly what we'll do. So we'll have one half, and then a plus b minus c times a plus b plus c, and then this is all happening over a plus b plus c. We're just bringing that down. But check it out, we get some immediate cancellation. Okay, good. But what do we have now? Now we have a plus b minus c over 2. And immediately that does not look like an integer. But in fact, it is an integer because the numerator is always even. And we can easily prove that the numerator is always even just by maybe 
the fact that we have a Pythagorean triple here. So let's say if A and B are both odd, then that means that A squared plus B Then that means that A squared plus B squared, which is equal to C squared, is even. But that tells us that C is even. But then the sum of A plus B is even, minus an even number is even. So putting that all together, we have A plus B minus C is most definitely even. And then there are a couple more cases to check. What happens if maybe A is even and B is odd? Or what happens if A and B are both even? Well, if A and B are both even, that's pretty clear. And then if A is even and B is odd, well, then that means that C has to be odd, but then we're kind of in the same situation. And I'm not even getting into the fact that perhaps one of these is not possible in the first place. Okay, so after all of that, like, you know, kind of trivial casework, we get to the point where this numerator is always even, which means, yes, we do have an integer for that expression right there. But if we look way back at the beginning, we see that we have, in fact, proven this lemma. Okay, so let's maybe move to our main result. Now that we finished proving our lemma, we're ready to prove our main result about these Pythagorean triples. And we're gonna do this via the principle of mathematical induction. Let's notice that the base case n equals zero is most definitely true. And we talked about that earlier. That's because the numerator simplifies to exactly what the denominator is. Furthermore, the n equals one case is now also kind of obviously true given the only thing standing in the way was the lemma. So now what we'll do is make an induction hypothesis and we'll use that induction hypothesis to prove maybe the next case, which is how you do things by induction. Okay, so let's maybe suppose for some k bigger than or equal to zero, I guess I should say for some k bigger than or equal to zero, we have a to the 2k plus one plus b to the 2k plus one plus c to the 2k plus one over a plus b plus c is an integer. Okay, good. And now what we'll do is consider the next case. So since we're just parametrizing kind of the odd exponents here, the next case will be the 2k plus three case. So that means we need to consider a to the 2k plus three plus b to the 2k plus three plus c to the 2k plus three all over a plus b plus c. And now given that we've got a Pythagorean triple here, we're gonna take that as motivation to split an a squared from the first term, b squared from the second term, and c squared from the third term. And of course, we'll use the fact that it's a Pythagorean triple to rewrite that c squared term. Okay, so let's do that. So we'll have a squared times a to the 2k plus one plus b squared times b to the 2k plus one plus c squared times c to the 2k plus one, but I'm gonna write that as a squared plus b squared times c to the 2k plus one. Then this is all over a plus b plus c. So of course I use the fact that we had a Pythagorean triple right here because this is equal to c squared. And now let's use kind of a similar bookkeeping strategy to what we did before to you know, write out that numerator. So let's see, we'll have an a squared times an a to the 2k plus one. What else do we have? We also have an a squared times c to the 2k plus one. Then I'm gonna leave a gap. We have a b squared times b to the 2k plus one plus we have a b squared times c to the 2k plus one. Then this is all over that denominator that we're just keeping along, so that a plus b plus c. 
So looking at these first two terms, I think it's kind of obvious what's missing. It's an a squared times b to the 2k plus 1. So let's add that in, a squared b to the 2k plus 1. But that means we need to subtract it over here so we don't end up changing anything. And then let's look at those last three terms, or those last two terms, one, two. And what's missing here is kind of obviously a b squared times a to the 2k plus 1. But that means we're need, going to need to subtract that off as well. So b squared a to the 2k plus 1. Then I just realized I missed my a squared term there. Now I can do some grouping and factoring. So let's group these first three terms and then these kind of a middle-ish three terms. And then what can we factor out of the first three? Well, an a squared. And then we're left with a to the 2k plus one plus b to the 2k plus one plus c to the 2k plus one. And then I'll put that all over a plus b plus c. Okay, good. And then for the next terms, I can factor out a b squared and I'll have that same sum of the 2k plus one power. So let's copy that down. Good. And then, well, we can factor out kind of a big greatest common divisor out of the last two terms, but we might as well just factor out an a times b. So we, here we have minus a times b, and then we'll have a times b to the 2k plus a to the 2k plus a to the 2k times b. And this is all over a plus b plus c. Okay, but let's see. By our induction hypothesis, this first term is an integer. Look over there. This second term is also an integer, and then by our lemma, this AB over the sum A plus B plus C is also an integer. So putting that all together, we see that we in fact do have an integer here. And that finishes this proof by induction. So I think there might be another way to do this using the kind of well-known parameterization of the Pythagorean triples. So if you want to try that out and post if you find a solution that way in the comments, you know, that would be much appreciated. And that's a good place to stop.